It's five o'clock on Wednesday, the 12th of April. You're listening to BBC Radio Norfolk. This is Norfolk Tonight, and I'm Stephen Lee. Good evening and welcome to the programme. In the next two hours, a detailed look at today's news and sports, plus a full travel service to help you home. The headlines. Unemployment in the county has dropped by over 500. A Norfolk drugs courier who was caught red-handed by police has been jailed for nine months. And the South African president, Nelson Mandela, has reinstated his wife Winnie to the country's government only a fortnight after sacking her. Later in this evening's programme, we ask how crucial is tonight's game at Carrow Road for the future of Norwich City Football Club. A protest at Norwich's Catholic Cathedral tonight hopes to change ideas about the role that women play in the church. And the man with the answers at his fingertips visits Norfolk to find out what questions to ask about conserving Scotland's heritage. But first, a summary of the day's news with Debbie Tubby. Unemployment in Norfolk has dropped by over 500. That's according to the seasonally adjusted figures. It brings the jobless total for March to 29,104. Nationally, unemployment has fallen for the 19th month in a row. Alison Turpin reports. The percentage of the workforce which is unemployed in Norfolk now stands at 7.8%. In most parts of the county, figures were down by about 100. But in South Norfolk, there was a slight rise. The smallest drop was registered in Broadland. In East Anglia, the seasonally adjusted figures show the number of jobless fell by 600, making 6.4% of the workforce unemployed. Norwich Crown Court has heard how a drugs courier was caught red-handed when he called on a house just as police were searching it. Lee Stimson from Hampton near Norwich was found to be in possession of almost a pound of cannabis. John Venables reports. The court heard police were searching a house in Dis when Stimson walked through the door. Police found 500 grams of cannabis resin, a set of scales and a mobile phone. Later at his home they found more drugs. When interviewed, Mr Stimson said the drugs were for his own use, but the prosecution pointed out that such large quantities would have lasted him for nine months. Mr Stimson of the post office stores, the street in Hapton, admitted possession with intent to supply and was jailed for nine months. The judge said he accepted that Stimson wasn't an international drugs dealer, but he had a previous record for drug supplying. A fortnight after Winnie Mandela was sacked from her job as an arts minister in South Africa, her estranged husband has reinstated her. President Mandela has issued a statement saying her dismissal was legally invalid. From Johannesburg, here's Peter Burden. President Mandela has reinstated his wife Winnie to his government after she launched a court action to get her dismissal declared unconstitutional. After talking to his lawyers, President Mandela has accepted that he failed to consult all the requisite people before he sacked her, and therefore the dismissal was invalid. However, Mrs Mandela's second term of office is likely to be short-lived. Her husband returns to South Africa tomorrow, when, according to his advisers, he'll reconsider her position and is expected to sack her again, this time having observed all the correct procedures to the letter. The High Court has ruled that it's unlawful for ports and local authorities to ban the export of live animals in order to avoid violence from animal rights activists. The court found in favour of companies wanting to export veal calves and other animals through Coventry Airport and the ports of Dover and Plymouth. The judges criticised the local authorities for acting out of narrow self-interest in seeking to block a lawful trade. Police in Kent now fear resumption of protests at Dover and are drawing up contingency plans. Channel Tunnel rail services between London, Paris and Brussels descended into chaos today after a high-speed Eurostar train got tangled up with overhead power lines. All services were halted throughout the morning and for hundreds of passengers a three-hour journey became a seven or even nine-hour nightmare. Some had to be bused to their destinations, others were forced to fly. The operators say services are now back to normal. Here's the BBC's transport correspondent Simon Montague. It was around 8.15 this morning when the service from Paris ground to a halt, its power pickup equipment badly damaged. All other Eurostar services were halted, including two London-bound trains near Calais and a Paris service held in Kent. 250 passengers on board the damaged train had to wait for four hours before being transferred onto coaches to complete their journeys. The other trains eventually arrived at least three hours behind schedule. All passengers were being offered either refunds or a free trip in future. This afternoon, the train at the centre of the chaos was finally removed to a nearby freight yard. 
European Passenger Services, the company which operates the Eurostar trains, says services are back to normal tonight. Detectives hunting the murderer of a woman who was battered to death at her home in Oxfordshire are trying to trace the owners of a car and a motorcycle seen near the house on the night of the killing. Police believe Janet Brown was attacked when she disturbed an intruder at her home. Clive Murray reports. Janet Brown's body was officially identified by her husband this morning. He'd been away on business in Switzerland at the time of her murder. Dr. Graham Brown was too distressed to appear at a news conference a short time ago to help in the appeal for anyone who might have information that could lead to his wife's killer. Janet Brown was found battered to death at her luxury home on Monday morning. She was naked with her hands handcuffed behind her back. Detective Superintendent Michael Short, who's leading the murder hunt, says police are appealing for the owners of a small car and a motorbike seen near Mrs. Brown's home on Monday evening to come forward and be eliminated from their inquiries. Four teenagers who mugged the actress Elizabeth Hurley at Knife Point have each been sentenced at Southwark Crown Court in London to 12 months at a young offender's institution. The judge told them that the robbery was of a thoroughly nasty kind. Police are setting up a base on a Kings Lynn housing estate in response to concern from the public about crime. North Lynn has the highest crime rate in the town, and the mini station will be used by the two beat officers there. Julian Sturdy reports. Plans for the beat base were outlined today at the launch of the Western Divisional Police Plan. Superintendent John Hale says fear of crime is a big issue in North Lynn, and they want to support the vast majority of people who want to lead a secure life. He's also setting up a burglary squad to tackle the number one priority for the coming year. Police in West Norfolk will also have a high profile at accident black spots while they'll be stepping up routine road checks to reduce car crime. More special constables are to be recruited to double the number in the division currently standing at 50. And a drugs liaison officer is being appointed to steer middle school children off drugs. Crime dropped by 7% last year. The Education Secretary in South West Norfolk MP, Gillian Shepherd, has said teachers should think long and hard before taking industrial action in schools. She was speaking after the Association of Teachers and Lecturers agreed on a ballot to see whether members were prepared to stage protests over rising class sizes. Plans by Tesco to build a huge new supermarket on the southern outskirts of Norwich look a little closer today. The local council says the latest details have just been submitted and there appears to be no complications so far. As Ian Heim reports, the outcome is vital for Tesco, who've had one local application turned down. Just last month, Norwich City Council turned down a plan by Tesco to build a supermarket at Bothorp because, among other reasons, local shops could lose out. That's why Tesco are pinning their hopes on the planned new store at Harvard Bridges on the old Dairy Crest site on the A140. Over 300 staff would be employed there, and South Norfolk District Council have already given outline planning permission. And next month, they'll be looking at the final design plans. Tesco already have one store in Norwich City Centre and one out at Sproston, but it sees the Harford Bridges site as essential to maintain its competitive presence in and around Norwich. The future of public parks in Norfolk is under threat, according to the Institute of Leisure and Amenity Management, who are holding a national conference. This week, Norwich City Council proposed £140,000 of cuts to park services, and the ILAM are proposing local authorities should be given a statutory duty to maintain parks, which are often the first service to suffer when cuts are being made. Byroni Nerup Redding runs a historic gardens consultancy in Norwich. She says parks play a vital role in urban areas. If um, it's going to be less safe for children to go and play in these parks if, for instance, Norwich is forced to cut back on the number of people l looking after the parks and being there to monitor them, this is a real threat to people who would like to use the parks, and particularly children who need them badly. The first student pilgrims have reached Norfolk for the Holy Week services at the National Roman Catholic Shrine at Walsingham. Dozens of Christians are walking from various corners of the country, carrying large wooden crosses. The northern leg from Nottingham arrived in Norfolk this afternoon before making the traditional crossing into Kings Lynn Bay by ferry. Alec Brady, who's a veteran of 17 eastern pilgrimages, says the weather is a big factor. It seems to vary in a, in a, a random way almost. You get blisters completely unexpectedly. But that, that doesn't matter. That's almost part of it. That's what makes it worth doing. The fact that with all the difficulties, with all the pain, with all the, the hardships, 
which thank goodness we've not had much of this year, uh, you that bonds you together much more tightly. BBC Radio Norfolk News, it's ten minutes past five. This evening's weather forecast comes from Clive Bolton at the Norwich Weather Centre. Good evening. Lots of sunshine today, more to come this evening, and then it looks like a largely fine and clear night. So after dark, the temperatures are going to fall fairly quickly, and I think inland we'll see values down to around 3 or 4 Celsius by the end of the night. That'll be low enough for some ground frost. Not quite as chilly as this by the sea, and there frost will stay away. Just a light northeasterly breeze. As for Thursday, in many ways like today, Certainly staying dry, there will be some cloud around, perhaps a little bit more than today, but even so, there will be sunny periods, and this will help the inland temperatures up to about 14 or 15 Celsius during the afternoon. That's the high 50s Fahrenheit, a little bit lower right by the sea, down around 11 Celsius, 52 Fahrenheit. And the northeasterly breeze will pick up a little to become a moderate breeze in most places by the afternoon. So, looking ahead now towards the holiday weekend, it looks as if Good Friday is going to be the warmest and brightest day, with plenty of sunshine and temperatures lifting themselves into the 60s Fahrenheit to about 17 Celsius, we think. Saturday will be cloudier, still fairly warm, and then Sunday and Monday are likely to be fairly cloudy days, but it does look as if much of the time will be dry. So, on that note, I'll say back to the studio. Traffic and travel from BBC Radio Norfolk. Busy on many of the main routes at the moment, but there are no serious hold-ups. However, Bridge, uh, Bishop Bridge in Norwich remains closed to all but bicycles for the moment. Uh, however, they do hope to have that open again to all traffic by the end of the month. The A11 is busy, and the roadworks between Attleborough and Spooner Row are likely to cause extra problems. And as normal, there is a 40 mile an hour speed limit in force. In Little Frensham, the A47 is getting busy and the roadworks are adding to the delays. There are temporary roadwork lights in place controlling the flow both ways, but over the Easter break, traffic will be back to normal as the works are suspended. And in Kings Lynn, the South Woodton Lane remains closed for waterboard work, although again, those restrictions will be lifted for Easter. That's it for now. Warren Lee, AA Roadwatch. Travel news from 95.1 and 104.4 FM. This is Norfolk Tonight from BBC Radio Norfolk. Stay with us between now and half past five. Great Yarmouth reacts to the news that one of the two ferries operating out of the town is to go. We look forward to tonight's game at Carrow Road and its importance to the future of the club. And women in the Catholic Church are calling for equality. But is this the way forward for the faith? But first, at 30 minutes past five, the number of young people looking for work in Norfolk has risen sharply according to the county's career service. New figures show more than 830 youngsters are currently unemployed in the area. Careers officers around the county are baffled by the sudden rise, but think, but think even one factor could be the ending of seasonal jobs. Claire Baradale has compiled this report. Figures out today show more than 830 young people are unemployed across the county. Tim Holt of Norfolk Careers Service says the trend recently has been encouragingly downwards, but the number of youngsters out of work has now increased. At the moment, regrettably, it seems to have um, risen slightly over the last quarter. The trend previously had been consistently downwards, but we now have 833 young people registered with us, compared with 728 in March 1994. That's an increase of 14%, and we're monitoring the situation very carefully. The Career Service isn't sure why there's been a rise in unemployment. Tim Holt again. It's not immediately clear. Um, several district careers officers have reported um, an increase in the numbers of young people registering. It may be something to do with winter casual seasonal work coming to an end and several young people registering at the same time and perhaps taking slightly longer than normal to find um, a permanent um, next move, be it a job, college or training programme. The Career Service is trying to help young people look for work by improving communications with employers. We started a canvas of employers last month. Vacancies from employers are still welcome, whether it's for a job or a training programme. And um, we are keeping in touch with all range of employers in the hopes of vacancies, especially as we've got school leavers coming onto the market and college leavers coming onto the market very soon. 
Tim Holt says the problem of unemployment is affecting youngsters of all ability. We have young people who have good GCSE and A-level qualifications registered with us, but it is across the board. Young people without such qualifications may find it a little more difficult. Sometimes employers do expect quite a lot. But at the moment, the picture um, is not too good um, across the board, although we're pleased to report an increase in the number of notified vacancies compared with this time last year. But he doesn't think young people will have to leave Norfolk to look for jobs elsewhere. I don't think people always take that into account. What they're looking for is the right niche for them, and we provide them with information on all the opportunities and then try and select the best one. I don't think it's going to result in young people um, leaving the county just because of um, comparatively high unemployment figures. They, they may move to somewhere where it's worse. So it is a question of seeking the best opportunity for them. Young people in Norwich think the career service could be of more help by giving the right information. I think it would put them on the right track and give them um, insight to maybe a different career move or something like that. They should um, ask you about what you want to be when you're older and they, because really they just want to find a job for you rather than what, finding what you want to be and how you, how you want to go about your life and everything. But I think they should actually ask you what you want to be. They should help you get more training for the job that you want to do. That's some young people in Norwich today ending that report on unemployment by Claire Barradale. Now, how's the latest development at Great Yarmouth Port dashed hopes that a passenger ferry will operate from the town in the not-too-distant future? Man in Line has withdrawn its second ferry only a month after it was first introduced. At the time, the new vessel was seen as a much-needed boost to the port. So, how is this latest decision going to affect the future of the port? On the line now is the chairman of Great Yarmouth Borough Council's Economic Committee, Tony Wright. First of all, Mr Wright, what's your reaction to the news that one of the Man in Line's ferries is now being withdrawn? Um, that was a bit of a disappointment, really, but I think what you have to bear in mind is that the reasons for the um, withdrawal was purely and simply on the basis of the restrictions for the size of the boats that could, uh, could come into our harbour. Um, the trade is there, so we're confident of that. So it's, it's simply that it's too big? The boat was too big. Um, I think that, that comes out quite clearly in their correspondence with the companies. Now, how do you think this is going to affect the need for an outer harbour? Well, I think everything that we're we're doing at the moment is aimed for the um, uh, development of an outer harbour and this won't stop as it probably pushes a little bit harder to try and um, finalise those arrangements. Right, so th there's definitely a need for this then? Oh, most definitely. I, I think the size of the boats that are obviously operating from the ports around the coast are getting larger and uh, Great Yarmouth Port wasn't developed for these large boats. How are you going to get the money to, you know, to, to, you know, to make room for these large boats that are going to come in? Because if you say, if, if the future is in large boats, then Great Yarmouth is in danger of being left behind, isn't it? Um, I don't think we'll be left behind as such. I, I think what we've got to be careful of is obviously the future. Um, as far as the financing is concerned, that's an issue that the Port Authority have taken on board with, with our support. And hopefully in the near future we'll be able to announce some uh, movement in that direction. Well, so how much progress is being made at the moment then? Well, as I understand it, there have been discussions in Europe um, to try to arrange the funding, but that's something that the Port Authority are more akin to than ourselves. Right. How about the hopes of a passenger ferry for the future? I mean, does, does this um, thing today, does that dash your hopes for that? Well, I think the passenger side of it was going to be a, um, a side issue. I think what we're more concerned with at this stage is the question of the, uh, the trade route. Um, as I said earlier on, the, the trade is there. That's not a question of the trade not being there. And I think that should we get a passenger line, that will be a bonus to the uh, route that's been opened. So if the trade is there, are we, do you think you're in danger of maybe losing more trade in the future? No, I don't think we'll be in danger of losing the trade. I think what we've got to ensure is that we go at full speed um, to try and get the Outer Harbour project ahead. Uh, the port of Great Yarmouth will always be here. That will always be trading with other um, countries. And hopefully the line between uh, Northern Europe and, uh, and Great Britain through Great Yarmouth will still exist. Mr. Ryan, thanks very much for joining us on the programme this evening. That's Tony Wright, the chairman of Great Yarmouth Borough Council's Economic Committee. 90 minutes past five now. Now, you don't need me to tell you that tonight's game between the Canaries and Nottingham Forest holds much significance, as well as being a match that, if won, will help stave off relegation. It's Gary Megson's first match as the caretaker manager. Norwich has another four games to come after tonight, in which they need two wins to prevent plummeting to the Ensley League. 
a demotion which could cost the club hundreds of thousands of pounds in lost revenue. In a moment, we'll hear from our football commentator Roy Waller to explain what pressures are on tonight, but first to Megson, who says he's still feeling the effect of the recent changes brought about by the sacking of manager John Dean. In myself, my, uh, my head at the moment, as you can well imagine, is a, a little bit of a whir. Now, uh, I've got to put all that to the back of my mind now and, uh, and make sure that we're well prepared. We'll just prepare the players as, um, as best we can. Um, we know, or we think we know, what we've got to do as regards get uh, get two wins from the last five games. But um, we want to win each and every game that we're going to go into now, and that starts with tonight. So uh, we'll do some preparation to give our, ourselves the best chance that we can um, to win that game. Well, Roy Waller joins me now. First of all, do you think these sentiments from Megson fully with much confidence? Yes, I think so. I think he knows what he's got to do. He knows you've got to prepare the players for tonight's match. It's important. It's a home game. They need the three points badly and therefore they'll be told it's not just uh, his reputation on the line tonight, first game in charge, it's the players as well. If they want to continue to play in the Premiership next season, it's them who've got to perform out there tonight. So I mean, tonight's game is obviously pretty crucial, but of course we've got another four chances after this game for another two wins, haven't we? Well, you have, but it, isn't it nice that you should, say, wrap up uh, the season well by, say, getting three points tonight, uh, then it just leaves you the four games to get the, the further three points. Now, don't put that much pressure on you. If you were to lose tonight, you've only got four games to put it right. Let's get the game right tonight. Let's get the three points, and then the remaining games can be uh, used to just picking up the extra three points, and that way you can do it uh, far better. What about Forest? Are they the easiest opponents, you think, that they'll face until the end of the season? No, I don't think they are. They, uh, they drew 1-1 at Forest against West Ham, uh, on Saturday, but their away form is good. They've got some very talented players in Brian Roy uh, and Stan Collymore. Dave Phillips, of course, used to play with Norwich. He'll be wanting to do a little bit better tonight against his old side. They're a very good side. Um, they've come back into the Premiership. They are riding high near the top, and they'll be wanting to finish as high as they can. Well, of course, nobody wants to see the Canaries relegated, but if they are, what kind of effect will that have on the, the club's income and its profits? Oh, quite a lot. I mean, I think probably the main sponsors will stay with them, but they lose a lot of little offshoots like television. Um, they will not want to come here, say, with Sky Television. Therefore, that's a lot of money to the club. And they're all always little offshoots that people will say, oh, hang on, they're not in the Premiership, so therefore we do want to put our money with them. So it's important that they continue there, otherwise they will suffer financially. I take it attendances will go down as well if they're, if they're down to the Ensley League? One would think so, although, of course, if they were to go down to that league and, and of course, uh, start to play good football and stay at the top, they might possibly get a few more to come along and see them. Who knows? But it would be a little bit of disaster for Norwich. I think the only... Premiership side really uh, in this part of the world, apart from it, because of course you look domed anyway. Now the man at the top is always the one that gets it. Now Robert Chase has come in for some criticism from fans for bringing the situation to this point by selling off some experienced players. How how much do you think he is to blame for that? Well, I think that uh, the chairman and the board have the last say. I think in whether a player goes or not. There are so many ifs and buts. If a player wants to go, I don't think you can stand in his way. It's all right for people to turn around and say. Um, well, the player doesn't have to go. I think that's wrong. If a player wants to go, I don't think you would be able to stand in his way. Um, and I think that if the board are honest enough to say that they have tried to retain players here that have moved on uh, by offering them better terms, then I think that, um, that they've that they'd have no alternative. I think what they have got to do, and I think Robert Chase has got to now say, OK, if we stay in the Premiership, we can do it. We've got to open up the purse strings. We've got to perhaps now uh, offer better wages to attract better players to this club. That's important. A lot of players, perhaps, that managers go for will not come here because of the terms offered. We've got to say, OK, let's get on with it now. Let's make sure the manager has... Uh, enough money to go out and buy players and also to pay them as well, but not go overboard and, s and pay silly prices. So, looking ahead to the Lions game, do you think Megson can pull off a win? Well, I hope so. Uh, his first game in charge, as I said, uh, he'll be judged, of course, on the remaining five games as to whether he uh, will continue as a Norwich City manager, and I'm sure that he'll be wanting to do well and to say, well, this is what I'm... I'm going to set my stall out this way, people will judge me on these five games and if he gets it right he'll be a hero if he doesn't well who knows
Well, Roy, thanks very much for joining us. And, of course, a sports special on BBC Radio Norfolk tonight at 7 o'clock. Now, reports are coming in of a big fire at the Assembly House in Theatre Street in Norwich. Mel Lacey of Norwich Police has seen something as what's happening, and he joins us now on the phone. So, Mel, what is the latest details that we have? Uh, good evening, Stephen. Yes, it is a major fire. Um, we have, at the moment, Theatre Street closed, Malt House Road is closed, and many surrounding streets are badly affected by the... Uh, the dense smoke that's currently billowing from the building. Do you have any idea what kind of damage has been done? Um, not at the moment. I'm afraid it's far too early to say. Obviously, uh, there is considerable damage. A short while ago, from where I'm sitting in the Bethel Street Police Control Room, with the old library in between uh, myself and that, I could see flames leaping above the, uh, the shell of the old city library, so it's quite extensive. And when did you first hear about it? Um, I believe it started just before five o'clock, although the exact time on the Friday I don't have at the moment, and, and you'll be pleased to know, I believe, at this stage that there aren't any reports of injuries, although it's very early yet, as yet to confirm that. Well, I'm sure people who live in Norwich will know that the Assembly House is a very old building, very historic. For those who maybe don't know the building so well, can you just maybe explain what the Assembly House is and what's there? Well, as you rightly say, it is a very old building. It contains a number of meeting rooms and an old cinema um, it's, it's a beautiful building and, and obviously part of the city's heritage. Uh, it's a terrible shame as to what's happening to it at the moment. Um, I would obviously like to seize upon the opportunity of asking any members of the public to avoid the city centre um, and beware of dense smoke, as I said, that's currently billowing towards probably, I would say, St Stephen's Roundabout and Chapelfield Road. Well, as you say, you're talking of billing it, billowing smoke and, and flames leaping in the end, if you can see them from the police station, do you, do you think there'll be much of the building left? Well, uh, again, it's far too early to, to say. I mean, I've seen a Simon, uh, Simon Snorkel uh, fire tender there with firemen working on the top, and uh, if anything, I would suggest that they're winning the battle, but it's obviously, as I said, a, a very, very extensive fire. Well, Mel, thanks very much for joining us on the programme. That's Mel Lacey of Norwich Police. And, of course, it goes without saying that as soon as we hear anything more on that fire at the Assembly House in Norwich, we'll bring it straight to you. 26 minutes past five now. Attempts to bring about a change in the role that women have in the Roman Catholic Church takes place tonight in Norwich as clergy from across the region gather at St John's Cathedral for the Chrism Mass. A group, Catholic Women for Ordination, are holding pre protests across the country this evening. Thus, will the ideas behind the group make any impact at all? Indeed, are there views for giving women more responsibility within the church, views of which being seen as the way forward for the faith? Well, in the studio now, I'm joined by the head of religious education at the Notre Dame School in Norwich, Claire Richards. Now, first of all, is the ordination of women in the Catholic Church the way the faith should be developing, do you think? That's a little bit of a difficult question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's difficult to see in the future and to know whether that's the way it should develop. I think it's an inevitable way, and I think it probably will have to come one day. Uh, with, you know, and I'm very happy with that, that it will come one day. I don't think it will be immediate at all. The present Pope is so firmly against it, I can't see it happening now. But I, I think it's inevitable. As far as I see the future of the Church, it isn't, it, it, it's not... The future that I would like to see is not directly related to women priests, though. So what's the future that you'd like to see then? Well, I've been looking a great deal into what happen what's happening in other parts of the world, particularly in South America, Central America, and the whole liberation theology movement, as it's called there, gives a much bigger say to the whole community, not just one portion of it, say women priests or men priests, but the whole community working together, particularly the lay people. So what I don't particularly and this is only a personal view, you understand, I don't particularly want to see just women priests with, with collars on taking the place of the men priests as they are now and creating, as it were, the professionals in the church. I want everyone to feel comfortable, to have a say, and that the decision-making, if you like, is, is much more general, is so that do, everyone's listened to. So do you think this approach that you're talking about will, you know, will satisfy those women who do feel they want to have more of a say? Well, well, I would have thought perhaps we need to listen to what and, and watch what is happening in South America. And I have a feeling that the women there are feeling much more comfortable with the church because they are having a say. They're having a say in their smaller groups. They're called base communities. And they are the very ordinary people. It's not just the, 
the, the ones, the, the, say, important people in the community, but the ordinary people, the ordinary people in the street who are concerned about everyday life and living their faith within it and concerned about the little ordinary everyday things, they're having a say. And, and I think that, you know, that's where I want to see the, mo the move come. Do you think there's any likelihood, though, of the next pope being that different in approach to Pope John Paul II? Well, who knows who's going to be the next pope. <laughs> a diff again, difficult. I mean, there, you know, you hear of, of there's going to be perhaps th this particular cardinal might be elected, and there is hope that there's, a, I think he's a Jesuit cardinal, and I'm interested that the Jesuit, the big Jesuit religious congregation of men, who are very powerful in the church, they've just recently had a congregation, a meeting of their superiors, and they have actually said, I've got the words here, that we've been part of an ecclesial tradition that has offended against women, and that um, we've been part or complicit in a form of clericalism which has reinforced male domination. Now, if the Jesuit order are, are realizing it, it isn't just a bunch of women, sort of fanatics on the edge. It's a realization, I think, that the whole church is coming to, that women have not been listened to. And, of course, if we had a new Jesuit pope, and this is what the Jesuits are saying, then maybe it, perhaps it's quicker... You know, going to come quicker than, than I even I think. Well, Claire, thanks very much for coming and joining us this evening. That's Claire Richards, who's the head of religious education at the Notre Dame School in Norwich. It's now half past five. <laughs> News headlines now with Debbie Tubby. More than 40 firemen have been called to a major fire in the Assembly House in Norwich City Centre. It's believed to have started just before five o'clock. Norfolk Police believe no one has been hurt. A number of streets have already been closed off, including Theatre Street. Norfolk Police are warning everyone to keep away from the area. Figures released today show that unemployment across Norfolk has dropped by over 500, bringing the jobless total for March to 29,104. Nationally, the number of people out of work and claiming benefit was down by more than 20,000 in March. A Norfolk drugs courier who was caught red-handed by police when he walked into the house they were searching has been jailed for nine months. Norwich Crown Court has been hearing how police found 500 grams of cannabis resin on Lee Stimson from Hampton in Norwich. Later at his home, they found more drugs. Initially, he claimed the drugs were for his own use, but later pleaded guilty to possession with intent to supply. Winnie Mandela has been given her government job back a fortnight after being sacked. Her estranged husband, President Mandela, has issued a statement saying her removal as an arts minister was legally invalid. So she's to be reinstated, only to be fired again, but this time correctly. A special police base is being set up on a housing estate in King's Lynn, following concern from the public about crime. The idea was announced at the launch of the Western Divisional Police Plan. Other improvements include the setting up of a burglary squad, an increase in routine road checks to reduce car crime, and more special constables are to be recruited. Radio Norfolk News, it's 5.32, there'll be more at 6. And this evening's sports news comes from Matthew Cudgeon. Good evening. Just over two hours before the biggest test of Gary Megson's footballing career, the Norwich City caretaker boss shoved in at the deep end on Monday following the resignation of John Dean will lead the Canaries into battle against Nottingham Forest at Carra Road. Forest's recent record away from home is formidable with seven straight wins. Norwich, meanwhile, have lost their last three games. There'll be no Robert Ullathorne in the City lineup. The midfielder's out with a knee injury and is likely to be replaced by Neil Adams. Another key member of the Norwich midfield tonight will be Ian Crook. He says if anyone can keep them in the Premiership, Gary Megson can. You only had to watch Gary as a player to know that he was 100% uh, committed. And I'm sure he'll be exactly the same uh, again as a manager. And he, uh, He's got the full backing of each and every one of the players and um, we know that he's I think a bit of very good motivator and hopefully as I say we can uh, pull it around and get a few results now. There are some other important games which could affect the relegation picture this evening. Arsenal who are just five points clear of the bottom four take on Liverpool at Highbury while another two clubs needing points seriously Chelsea and Southampton face each other at Stamford Bridge. Meanwhile, it's the replay of the FA Cup semi-final between Crystal Palace and Manchester United tonight at Villa Park. Only around 4,000 Palace fans are expected to be at the game after the London club's directors urged them to boycott it following the death of a fan last Sunday. Palace boss Alan Smith says his players have to be professional in their approach to the match. 
we conducted ourselves very well on Sunday. By the way, so did both teams, and so did the crowd once it got inside the, the stadium. Um, but we've got a, a good side, and they'll be up for it. They, they know they're 45 minutes uh, or 90 minutes away from Wembley. I don't think it'll come into their minds. I think they think uh, it's another game, it's another day. Uh, we can improve on what we did, and whilst we won't be taking Manchester United lightly, I think there are areas for improvement. Eric Cantona's lawyer, Jean-Jacques Bertrand, has said the player was not leaving Manchester United for Inter Milan, as reported this morning. Bertrand has been to having talks with Manchester United and Inter Milan officials, but he says the sole priority is to establish Cantona's future in England from October, when his suspension ends. Yorkshire's Darren Goff has won England's Cricketer of the Year award. Earlier today, he collected his £7,500 first prize. He missed the last two tests of the Ashes tour thanks to a foot injury, but is now well on the road to recovery. He gave this reaction to winning the prize. It's a great arrival, but it's going to be an ad act to fall. <laughs> it's a great honour to win this trophy, and hopefully um, I'm going to carry on against the West Indies, and then on to South Africa and the World Cup, because it's a, it's a, well, it's a really big year for England. The injuries are fine now. I'm going to captain the Yorkshire Academy tomorrow in a friendly game at Edinley. Um, and I'm sure everything will go well there and I can get back to the first big match against Worcester in the Benson Edges. Norfolk tennis youngster David Crawley is out of the British National Junior Championships in Telford. David from Great Yarmouth lost his quarterfinal in straight sets to Yorkshire's David Sherwood, 6-3, 6-4. An official from Motorsports Governing Body, the FIA, has said the Benetton and Williams teams were not guilty of cheating over the use of fuel during the Brazilian Grand Prix. Michael Schumacher and David Coulthard were disqualified after finishing first and second when irregularities were found in their fuel. The official said the problem was a technical one caused by an error of negligence. Despite the comments, the disqualifications are expected to stand at an appeal in Paris tomorrow. The proposed merger between Salford and Oldham as part of a new Super League in Rugby League has hit difficulties. After a six-hour meeting, the two chairmen couldn't agree on a venue, the coaching staff, the board, or even a new name for the club. Oldham chairman Jim Quinn says despite the problems with Salford, it's also his job to convince the fans the idea is a good one and reassure the players and coaches of merging clubs about their future. Quinn believes the game could disappear without the new league. I think when I explain my stance with them, I think they will, in some way, support me. They will be very guarded in that support, and they'll have to trust me. And I'll have to respond to that trust. And there will be times when I can't go no further in my negotiations. And there will be times where there will be an impasse. And there might have to be a situation established where there is some form of mediation introduced into this whole uh, negotiating uh, structure to resolve it. We're on the air with soccer special tonight at 7 o'clock. Coverage from Carrow Road of Norwich City versus Nottingham Forest. That's at 7. Our next update is 6.45. You're listening to BBC Radio Norfolk. This is Norfolk Tonight with Stephen Lee. Good evening. Coming up before 6 o'clock, public parks in the county may not always be something to be taken for granted. Now the Broads is providing the answer for the conservation of Scotland's national heritage and victims of conmen in Norfolk speak out. Financial news now, and the UK's biggest hotelier, Forte, reported a huge increase in profits, despite an acknowledgement that consumer demand is flat. Meanwhile, there's been yet another fall in unemployment. Here's Rebecca Marston, the BBC's business staff. Forte's profits swelled by 65% to £127 million. The company also runs the Little Chef and Happy Eater roadside cafes, as well as the budget Travelodge hotels and the Post House chain. It also owns a sizeable chunk of the Savoy Group, which reported results yesterday. Forty has almost a thousand hotels across the globe, but most of its businesses are here in Britain. So Rocco Forte, chairman of the company, said that consumer demand was flat, but he's not bemoaning the lack of the feel-good factor. He says that goes with a strong economy. I think there's this uh, vision that the, the, the economy should move forward dramatically. What we are facing in this country is low inflation, which we've never known for uh, since since the war, to to a, to any great degree, um, 
and it's the right thing for the country. If you have low inflation, uh, things aren't going to be moving forward uh, as fast. You shouldn't expect uh, uh, great leaps forward, because great leaps forward mean great leaps back. So we should actually be very pleased that the economy is moving forward in a steady, in a steady fashion. This morning's economic figures showed the 19th monthly fall in the number of people out of work and claiming benefit, but there were concerns among economists that the falls were getting smaller. Besides, the number of vacancies advertised at job centres, about a third of the total of unfilled jobs, was down again for the fourth month in a row. The 100 index of leading shares closed up 19 points at 3,210. The pound closed down three quarters of a cent at $1.58 and three quarters, and it's down three quarters of a fennec at two marks, 23 and three quarters. That's Rebecca Marson of the BBC's business staff. Now let's return to our story this evening. More than 40 firemen have been called to a major fire in the Assembly House in Norwich City Centre. It's believed to have started just before five o'clock. Norfolk Police believe that nobody's been hurt. A number of streets have already been closed off, including Theatre Street. Well, we're joined live now from the scene by Roger Ryan. Roger, what's happening at the moment? Well, it's chaos here at the moment, Steve. Uh, the street has been uh, uh, blocked off. I can confirm that nobody has been hurt in the fire, as far as we know at the moment. Um, there's about uh, 40 or 50 people here standing outside the assembly house. The fire has made a right old mess of the roof. Um, there's nobody inside. The fire people are here. The police are here, and uh, onlookers, as I say, about 50 or 60. There's no traffic here, of course. The road has been blocked off. And joining me now is somebody who, who saw the fire. What's it like at the moment? What do you see down there? Um, well, the fire seems to be very, very bad at the moment, actually. Um, I was in the building initially when it started. The fire alarm went off, and, um, well, um, we went outside, and it, there was just a, a little bit of smoke just above the um, main entrance. But within about five minutes, the flames um, really roared up and, and uh, it, it's got quite bad now. And you actually work in the building. What do you do in the building? Well, actually, no, I don't work in the building. My, my band works in the building regularly. Um, I run a, a big band that works in the building. Um, and, and you're in there at and, the time? And we, we, we work, we, I was at a meeting at the time, yes. What was it like for the people leaving the building? Um, well, I think the people, as they left the building, were a bit surprised. I, didn't, I think they probably thought it was just routine. Um, as I said, there wasn't much smoke to start with. It's just a little bit of smoke above the door. Um, the fire engines got there within about three minutes. Um, so I, I think na now there are a lot of people there and they, they all seem to be quite concerned because obviously that's quite a, a historic building for Norwich. Did you actually see the flames inside the building? Um, yes, I saw the flames on the first floor. Um, but that's only just recently that, that I've noticed those. So. Um, I think the fire, uh, firemen have now got that under control. As I said, we heard nobody's been hurt. Was there panic in the building when the fire broke out? Um, I think actually the, the building seemed to be evacuated quite well. Um, I didn't actually notice any panic myself. Um, so, uh, no, I think, I think people, as I said, thought it was a, a routine fire alarm. How soon were the emergency services there? Well, they, they seemed to be there within about three minutes, um, the, the fire service were there quite quickly. Um, they didn't seem to actually get water on the building very quickly. Um, I, don't, I don't know, that they, they probably had to get their equipment sorted out. And the ambulances were there shortly after. Your name, sir, before you leave? Uh, yes, my name's Jonathan Wyatt. Jonathan, let's move on now to another eyewitness. Well, you, you weren't inside the building. Well, it was Jonathan Wyatt. He was inside the building when the, the fire actually happened. I can confirm that uh, the building is still ablaze. Well, I was going to ask you that, Roger. I mean, I think the fire is still there, is it? What are the fire service doing now? At the moment, they're trying to control the fire. They've got um, an extension, a Simon Snorkel extension, uh, leaning over the roof of the assembly house. And as far as we can see at the moment, uh, they're using water to keep the fire under control. Of course, as uh, Mr. Wyatt said, the assembly house is one of Norwich's most historic buildings and uh, the roof is a fair old mess at the moment though the uh, walls and the rest of the building seem okay at the moment and the fire is still still burning well and mel lacy from norfolk police was telling us earlier how he was standing just across the road and watching flames leaping into the air is it still that bad not quite uh you the flames are dying down there's still plenty of smoke um as far as i know the fire is relatively under control and as I can reiterate to you, as far as we know, there are no casualties. People were evacuated from the building. Theatre Street has been closed off to all but the emergency services and the media.
Now, how about the building? You said that the, the roof is very badly damaged. Is there much of the building left standing? Um, the walls are still there. Uh, as I say, it's just the roof which has taken the brunt of the fire. But I'm told that the fire is now out. Well, no, it's, it's not quite out yet, but uh, it's certainly, uh, certainly well, under, well under control. Well, Roger, thanks very much for joining us this evening. And, of course, if anything else develops, we'll keep you informed. 16 minutes to 6 now. Public parks in Norfolk are under threat as local authorities look to their own green spaces to make sacrifices when cutting their budgets. That's according to the Institute of Leisure and Immunity Management, who are holding a conference in Coventry to assess how parks can be maintained in the current political climate. It comes in a week when Norwich City Council is proposing to cut its parks budget by £140,000. Andrew Woodger reports. Balmy summer days lolling around on the grass, the thwack of tennis balls, young lovers listening to music from the bandstand. The chocolate box image of the park may have changed, but Brioni Nero Reading, who runs a historic gardens consultancy in Norwich and is founder of the Plantation Garden Preservation Trust, says green public spaces are vital in urban areas. Health, for a start, which we all know about. Secondly, the um, spiritual element that really people living amongst bricks and mortar absolutely need grass and trees to get some sort of sense of renewal. Obviously, there is the need for space for people to run about in, whether or not it's playing tennis or chasing a football around or just walking. Norwich City Council has this week proposed to cut its park's budget by £140,000. The Institute of Leisure and Amenity Management are holding a national conference because they feel public parks are under serious threat now. Spokesman Nick Reeves says people need to be made more aware of the importance of parks. We do take park spaces for granted. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of time and money is spent in, in arguing the case for, uh, for buildings and fine examples of architecture, and, and one wouldn't want to decry that. But, but there, there, seems to be, there needs to be a balance of, of care about uh, all our heritage, and certainly many of our park member spaces are part of this country's national and, and local heritage, and they need protection. Norwich's parks outside the city centre were mainly built by the unemployed during the interwar depression years. City Council landscape architect George Ishmael says a review of the park's role is currently being undertaken, but he fears for their future. Well, at the moment things look pretty bleak, really, uh, generally because of cutbacks in uh, local government spending. O over many years, I think uh, urban parks in general have been starved of, uh, of funding, and uh, now the, the crunch has really come. The worst scenario, I suppose, would be that some parks might actually close down. Certainly, uh, certain uh, resources within the parks might be lost, such as that there might be fewer uh, uh, playing fields or uh, fewer uh, lawn tennis courts. The Institute of Leisure and Amenity Management feels parks should become a statutory responsibility for local councils, so that when purse strings are tightened, parks will remain protected by law. Nick Reeves sees a wider image as well. What we're saying is that uh, there needs to be this strategic overview, this kind of, uh, you know, um, wider vision for the future of public park and open spaces in order to give local authorities the, the moral support, if you like, uh, that they need. And this is what uh, we're talking about today, is giving, not talking about just uh, moaning about the fact that there's a lack of resources, but also to try and give parks and open spaces and, and their managers uh, some moral support and an injection of... Um, publicity and create a higher profile. The Norwich Parks Review is welcoming opinions from the public. The exhibition is currently at City Hall. The ITAM and other conservation groups are urging the public to appreciate the importance of parks before they disappear. It's good to touch the green, green grass of home. And that report compiled by Andrew Woodger. 6.48 now, time for the news headlines. More than 40 firemen have been called in to a major fire in the Assembly House in Norwich City Centre. It's believed to have started just before 5 o'clock this evening. Norfolk Police believe that nobody has been hurt. A number of streets have already been closed off, including Theatre Street. Eyewitnesses have reported the roof being very badly damaged, and the fire service are working hard to bring the fire under control. If you stay with us, in a couple of minutes' time we'll return to the scene and hear more about what's happening. Figures released today show that unemployment across Norfolk has dropped by over 500, bringing the jobless total for March to 29,104. 
Nationally, the number of people out of work and claiming benefits was down by more than 20,000 in March. A Norfolk drugs courier who was caught red-handed by police when he walked into the house they were searching has been jailed for nine months. Norwich Crown Court has been hearing how police found 500 grams of cannabis resin on Lee Stimson from Hapton in Norwich. Later at his home, they found more drugs. Initially, he claimed the drugs were for his own use, but later pleaded guilty to possession with intent to supply. Winnie Mandela has been given her government job back a fortnight after being sacked. Her estranged husband, President Mandela, has issued a statement saying her removal as an arts minister was legally invalid. So she's to be reinstated, only to be fired again, but this time correctly. The weather forecast? After evening sunshine, there'll be clear periods tonight with minimum temperatures of 3 degrees Celsius and also some ground frost. You're listening to Norfolk Tonight from BBC Radio Norfolk, and I'm Stephen Lee. The Norfolk Broads have been paid a special visit by a group of top-level officials from Scottish National Heritage. It's part of a fact-finding trip to learn how the Broads protected area is managed and maintained by working in partnership with voluntary and government bodies. Magnus Magnusson, well known for his quizzing techniques on Mastermind, was among the visiting group in his role as chairman of SNH. Part of a two-day visit included taking the water on South Walsham Broad, where Alison Turpin joined the chief executive of the Broad's authority, Aitken Clark. We're all on board a, a historic Edwardian uh, wherry here, the, the Hartor. Sky's blue, it's a beautiful day, the Broads are glinting. It couldn't have picked a better day to show off the Broads. But what are you hoping to communicate? Well, we're hoping to share experience. Scottish Natural Heritage is entrusted with caring Scotland's lovely wilderness environment. I think the most beautiful environment left in Europe unspoiled. Here on the Broads we're having a big restoration program. We're hoping to share with um, Magnus and his team uh, some of the ideas we put into place through our team effort. What do you think this particular success story is with the Broads? The Broads story is really one of trying to a lovely area that's been in a sense degraded over the past um, 20 or 30 years back into good health and the signs are encouraging we're really bringing the broads back into the magical boating place that it used to be and it's returning to that state and the natural environment is beginning to re-emerge clean healthy and inviting now magnus magnuson is, is chairman of scottish natural heritage that's a, a surprise role for many people who see you perhaps behind the desk at the mastermind a trip on a wherry must be a nice relief it's beautiful as they say here this is my first formal visit to the broads we've had a wonderful two days learning about and learning from the experience of our colleagues down here we've been enormously impressed i think most of all by the kind of patient immensely painstaking work that's gone on to bring people on board. The Broad's Authority is a specific solution to a specific challenge, a specific problem. It's been fascinating to see how it has grown out of the ground rather than being posed from on top of it. And so decisions that are made are made by the people as a whole and constantly explained. Explanation, interpretation, the reasons for doing things. You'll never achieve protection by imposing it on people. Only if you have them willingly understanding why the protection is necessary, why the enhancement is a good thing for the people who live here as well as for the people who come to visit here. Roger Cross, you're Chief Executive of Scottish Natural Heritage. What are you going to take back from this experience to Scotland? We came down here for particular reasons. Uh, we were very interested in the tailor-made solution for looking after the broads. Uh, for the recreational interest, for the ecological interest and for the benefit of the local people and the visitors. Mark Wakelin, you're the Chief Navigation and Water Recreation Officer here on the Broads. What particular message do you hope the uh, Scottish visitors take away from today's trip? I think what we hope they'll see is that it's possible to manage recreation, including quite sophisticated technical rep uh, recreation, in a sympathetic way which doesn't damage in the longer term the ecology of the area. And in fact, in the Broads, we start perhaps from uh, a negative base there, and we have restoration work to do and are managing. That's Mark Wakely and the Chief Navigation and Water Recreation Officer, ending that report by Alison Tappin. Let's return to the fire in Norwich City Centre this evening, which has partly destroyed the historic Assembly House. Let's go back to Roger Ryan, who's outside the Assembly House now. Yes, I can confirm that the fire is still burning at the Assembly House. 
Joining me now is Sergeant Neil Ferguson of Norwich Police. What's the latest situation, Sergeant Ferguson? Well, the latest that uh, I'm able to tell you is that the roof is uh, extensively damaged. There's severe uh, fire damage to the, the top of the, the building. We can still see flames inside the building itself, and the Chief Fire Officer is in attendance, Mr. Smith. What scale of the operation involved, what is the scale of the operation involving the emergency services? Well, it, it's obviously a serious incident. Uh, there are 12 fire appliances from around the Norwich area in attendance and more arriving by the minute. So clearly a very serious incident. What's your main concern at the moment? Safety, uh, obviously, has got to be number one priority. Um, I'm glad to say that there are no reported injuries. We've evacuated neighbouring buildings just to, to be on the safe side and uh, we're just... Uh, um, thankful for the fire service now who are fighting the fire and um, it, it all appears in control. You say that uh, involves neighbouring uh, buildings, that includes the Theatre Royal? Yes, but there is no damage to the Theatre Royal. Uh, we've evacuated neighbouring buildings just to be safe, uh, but the damage is contained just to the assembly rooms. What is the state of the building at the moment, do you know? I can only tell you from what I see from uh, directly opposite, uh, the roof is very badly damaged and I can see flames inside the building. I would guess that there is uh, severe damage inside. Sergeant Ferguson, thanks very much for joining me. That's the latest there from the scene of the fire. Steve and I'll join you again shortly after six o'clock. Thanks very much, Roger. That's Roger Ryan reporting from the Assembly House in Norwich. Five to six now. Elderly people in Norfolk are becoming victims of a trend in crime involving con men. The police call them artifice burglaries and they're warning old people to be on their guard and to fish appropriate safety locks to their houses. Andrew Woodger now reports on the case of two 75-year-old pensioners who were robbed in their Norwich council house. Mr and Mrs Leslie Carey of Mile Cross in Norwich believe bogus callers were responsible for the theft of nearly a £1,000 from their living room. Mr Carey, who's a former Japanese prisoner of war who worked on the bridge over the River Kwai, believes they were casing the joint when they first came round in February. I was sitting in the chair when uh, just round about dinner time, well I'd had my dinner anyway, so I was round much probably round about half past one. And uh, now came the door and uh, the back door and uh, I looked up and I see two young fellows at the back window. And they saw me sitting there and they waved. So I got up and went to sort of the back door and handed, unlocked the back door and I asked them what they wanted. And one of them said, oh, he said, do we come and see if you want to buy any Lionel or mats? So I said, no. He said, I want none of my time of life. I don't want to buy mats or Lionel. So I say, um, fair enough, I say. So I said, well, cheery all, and they went. DCI Bernie Kerrison of Norwich CID says this type of crime by thieves posing as utility board officials or salesmen is occurring two to three times a week. Well, it's obviously an organised gang who are, who are doing this crime. That's... Uh become more prevalent over the last six weeks uh, and the same period last year we suffered uh, greatly from uh, from that type of crime. Mrs Violet Carey was the only one at home a month later when the Milecross couple were robbed. She was making the dinner when she heard the burglars already in the house. I asked him what he wanted. He said he was looking for wallpaper. I saw a little wallpaper in there. This is a council house. So how, how did he get in? I don't know. That's what we want to know. The only way I can say, because he couldn't get out of the front door, is he'd have gone out of it. Because that got a lock, and he didn't know how to, how to work, you see. So he had to keep in there, and he was he was shaking. He was frightened. And, uh, you know, he, he stood there a good while talking, and all of a sudden another boy come up. He said, oh, we found the pipe. And I know him when I say him. However, DCI Kerrison says it's often problematic for old people to identify thieves. Our difficulty begins when we have to get these elderly victims to the police station to try and identify the suspects. And bearing in mind the age of these individuals, it's very difficult. Uh, they are hard of hearing, their sight is impaired and consequently they have great difficulty in identifying these rascals when they're faced with the trauma of going on, along on an identification parade. Norfolk Police are recommending people to fit safety chains on their front doors while they seek confirmation of the true identities of bogus callers. All official callers should have an ID with them and phone calls to the relevant company should confirm this. 
Meanwhile, Mr and Mrs Carey would like to thank all those who've written to them offering support. And that's Andrew Woodger reporting. The commercial radio station Radio Broadland is facing a competitor to broadcast in the Norwich and Great Yarmouth areas. A new consortium has put in a bid and a decision about who will be granted the license is expected from the radio authority by the summer. Ian Himes reports. Radio Broadland has been on air since October 1984, but this is the first time its license has been re-advertised by the radio authority. Its managing director, Russell Stewart, is sure that because of its long-standing success, the new license will go to them. We're certainly extremely confident because our track record over the last 10 years uh, I think quite clearly demonstrates that we've not only done a good job for, uh, from our own business point of view, we've done an excellent job in terms of uh, retaining um, a very high listening base throughout the whole Norfolk area. But on the horizon is a newly formed company which also is confident of getting the license. It's Norfolk Broadcasting. Co-director Ron Coles has a BBC and commercial radio background and feels his new ideas have an edge on the existing station. In most parts of the country, radio stations have split their frequencies and uh, offer different services on AM and FM. And that's something that Broadland, for whatever reason, has decided not to do. Um, we believe, therefore, that we could offer a better service to the local people by presenting two services to them one on FM, aiming at uh, younger listeners, and another on AM, with a gold format, for the older ones. The new licenses come into effect at the beginning of 1997. They've been granted by the Radio Authority, which hopes to announce its decision within two months. Ian Himes reporting. Coming up after the six o'clock news, we'll bring you the latest on the Assembly House fire in Norwich. And we'll be speaking to an expert in historic buildings who'll be able to explain more about the significance of this evening's damage to the city centre building. The Talk of the County on 95.1 and 104.4 FM. This is Norfolk Tonight from BBC Radio Norfolk. It's six o'clock, the news with Debbie Tubby. More than 40 firemen are fighting a major fire at the historic Assembly House in Norwich. Roads in the area have been sealed off because of dense smoke, and the nearby Theatre Royal has been evacuated. On the scene is our reporter, Roger Ryan. Well, there's still lots of smoke pouring from the roof of the historic Assembly House in Norwich. The fire broke out just, after, just before 5 o'clock this, this evening. We can't see any flames at the moment. We've been told that nobody has been hurt. The roof is very badly damaged. But as far as I can see from here in Theatre Street, the walls of the, the Assembly House are reasonably intact. Theatre Street has been blocked off to all traffic. There's about 30 or 40 people here, onlookers, watching the, the fire as uh, firemen and police do their best to bring the blaze under control. Um, firefighters have been here for the best part of an hour to bring it under control. Um, people were inside the building at the time of the blaze, but as I can reiterate, nobody has been hurt. Roger Ryan reporting for BBC Radio Norfolk in Norwich. The fire was clearly visible from the control room at the Battle Street Police Station. Police spokesman Mel Lacey describes the initial impact of the blaze. This is a major fire. Um, we have at the moment Theatre Street closed. Malthouse Road is closed and many surrounding streets are badly affected by the, uh, the dense smoke that's currently billowing from the building. Obviously uh, there is considerable damage. A short while ago from where I'm sitting in the Battle Street Police Control Room with the old library in between uh, myself and that, I could see flames leaping above the, uh, the shell of the old city library, so it's quite extensive. BBC Radio Norfolk News, it's ten minutes past six. That's Debbie Tubby reporting. Well, before we go on to the weather forecast, let's return to the Assembly House in Norwich. The latest reports from the scene of the fire is that the Assembly House suggests that smoke is actually increasing. Let's join Roger Ryan. Yes, it is the case, Stephen. The fire is getting worse. Tell us all about it is Sergeant Ferguson from Norwich Police. Sergeant Neil Ferguson, what's happening at the moment? Well, I'm told that the roof has uh, collapsed on the main building. Uh, that very narrowly missed two firefighters inside, but thankfully they weren't injured. But in the last few moments, the fire has spread to an adjoining building, and uh, that is well ablaze at the moment. So what sort of problems does this bring for you? For the police, uh, thankfully not too many problems. For the firefighters, obviously a, a great deal of problems because they've got a secondary blaze now to contend with. So it was the roof to start with, but now we're talking about the sides of the assembly house and the front of the building too. 
I'm told that initially the fire uh, is thought to have started in the roof. Um, there were clearly flames seen inside the building. Now the, the, the fire has spread to an adjoining building, but you can't quite see it from the road, which is the, the only viewpoint I've had, so I can't tell you whereabouts the fire is there, but clearly the roof is alight, certainly. And you can confirm it is getting worse at the moment? It appears so, yes. From a police point of view, what sort of operation are you mounting this evening to deal with this fire? Well, we're containing the scene and allowing the firefighters room to tackle the blaze. That's got to be the first priority, uh, and safety of people, obviously. And once we've managed to, to deal with the fire, we then need to look at uh, how the fire started and whether or not it was uh, a criminal act. There must have been 50 or 60 onlookers down there when we first arrived, about 5.30. Did they cause you any problems? No, there weren't. Uh, there were no problems reported that I know of. Uh, people were curious to see. A lot of people are clearly upset as to what they're seeing, especially seeing as it's so close to the library. You just wouldn't believe that you could have two fires of this nature so close to each other. Any idea how it started? I know it's very early at the moment. It is too early, I'm afraid. No, no idea whatsoever. Away from the fire, traffic problems. This is a major street in the centre of Norwich. How are you coping? <laughs> it couldn't have happened on a worse night. It's a football night. We've had to close off roads, obviously, around here. The traffic is now cleared away, but, uh, of course, it caused some problems at the time. And I'd just like to thank drivers for being patient. Sergeant Ferguson, thanks for joining us this evening. That's Roger Ryan reporting live from the scene of the Assembly House in Norwich. Well, a few minutes later, but let's return, as promised, to the weather forecast this evening, and we're joined by Clive Bolton from the Norwich Weather Centre. Good evening. Lots of sunshine today, more to come this evening, and then it looks like a largely fine and clear night. So, after dark, the temperatures are going to fall fairly quickly, and I think in land we'll see values down to around 3 or 4 Celsius by the end of the night. That'll be low enough for some ground frost. Not quite as chilly as this by the sea, and there frost will stay away. Just a light northeasterly breeze. As for Thursday, in many ways like today, certainly staying dry, there will be some cloud around, perhaps a little bit more than today, but even so, there will be sunny periods, and this will help the inland temperatures up to about 14 or 15 Celsius during the afternoon. That's the high 50s Fahrenheit. A little bit lower right by the sea, down around 11 Celsius, 52 Fahrenheit. And the northeasterly breeze will pick up a little to become a moderate breeze in most places by the afternoon. So, looking ahead now towards the holiday weekend, it looks as if Good Friday is going to be the warmest and brightest day, with plenty of sunshine and temperatures lifting themselves into the 60s Fahrenheit to about 17 Celsius, we think. Saturday will be cloudier, still fairly warm, and then Sunday and Monday are likely to be fairly cloudy days, but it does look as if much of the time will be dry. So, on that note, I'll say back to the studio. That's Clive Bolton at the Norwich Weather Centre. You're listening to BBC Radio Norfolk. This is Norfolk Tonight with Stephen Lee. It's now 14 minutes past six. Well, a few moments ago, we heard the latest from the Assembly House in Norwich, where fire has destroyed much of the roof and indeed part of the building as well. The roof, as I say, has been destroyed, and a short while ago, Norfolk's Chief Fire Officer, Brian Smith, told Claire Baradell what the latest developments were during a press conference. I first of all heard the fire engines at about five to five and then the fire broke through the roof, started to break through the roof, the smoke started coming through the tiles, not very much initially, but then suddenly the whole roof seemed to take hold and the, we could see the fire spreading from one end of the roof to the other. It was moving from the Norvea cinema end towards the kitchen end of, of the assembly house and it spread very, very rapidly and in fact it was some time before the fire engines were able to get water into the roof of the building to try and check the blaze but I was surprised by the speed with which it spread all I can say to you at this stage is we have no idea of how the fire started where it started um, you can see for yourselves we've got a very serious fire situation here in yet another historic building in the city which is very upsetting um, but it is a very serious fire. We've got difficulty now in gaining access into the building because the roof and the top floor has actually collapsed through. Um, we've had to pull some of the crews out of the building, um, which, you know, is a problem for us now because we were hoping to be able to get in there to actually fight the fire. But that's causing us some difficulties. We're currently also trying to protect the two wings that you see, the white wings that come out at the sides because there is a danger at the moment of the fire spreading into those, so we've got crews inside 
trying to stop the fire coming through. Other than that, at the moment, we've done, all I can say is minimal salvage work to get valuables out, uh, but I will shortly be talking to the manager of the assembly rooms to see what else needs to be brought out. Uh, other than that, I really can't give you much more information, but it's a serious fire as, as far as the city is concerned. Can you tell us how many pumps? Um, well, 12 to start with, uh, but I would imagine we've probably got a lot more than that now. I should think we're probably up to about 15 or 16. Uh -huh. Well, that was the Chief Fire Officer for Norfolk talking there to Claire Barradale at a press conference held just a few moments ago in Norwich. Well, let's return now live to the scene, and here's Roger Ryan. Yes, I'm joined now by PC Mel Lacey from Norfolk Police. Mel, what's happening tonight as far as the Theatre Royal is concerned? Actually, we're very hopeful that performance will go ahead, but one thing that will not happen, and that is coaches will not be able to get into Theatre Street. So, therefore, anybody planning to come to the theatre by car, use the, use the normal parking places, but coaches will not get into Theatre Street tonight. What about, mo so motorists are reasonably okay, but if you're coming by coach, you won't get too close to the Theatre Royal? That's correct. The normal car parks in the city centre are open. You will not get into Theatre Street at all. Now, besides the Theatre Royal tonight, there's a big football match on at Carrow Road. How's that been affected by the fire? Well, obviously some people will plan their journeys through the city centre and uh, tonight they won't be able to. So I would suggest they stick to the inner link road, the outer link road or the southern bypass, but do not come to the city centre. You've been watching what's been happening uh, this evening. What's the latest from the scene? Well, it looks very much as though it's under control, although there are still some flames coming from the uh, roof of an outbuilding. Um, at one stage, of course, the flames were extremely high and were visible above the shell of the old library. But uh, it looks very much as though the fire brigade are winning the battle at the moment. PC Mel Lacey, thanks for joining us this evening. And that's Roger Ryan reporting from the Assembly House in Norwich. Well, the Assembly House, which is run by a trust, is one of the most historic buildings in the city. Here in the studio, I'm now joined by Dr. Bill Wilton, who's an historic buildings consultant with the Norwich firm Wilton Compton. He regularly advises the government on listed buildings, and he's surveyed every National Trust property in East Anglia. First of all, how important is the Assembly House? It dates from the 13th century, I believe. There was a college, the College of St. Mary in the Fields, on the site, founded about 1250, hence the name, uh, Chapelfields. Small fragments of it remain in the west wing of the present building, which seems to be more or less intact. And there's a good bit of the brick vaulted cellar surviving under the restaurant. But its real history comes from the days of the disillusion. The chapel was dissolved in 1544, and the collegiate building was used as a mansion, ultimately bought in 1609 by Sir Henry Hobart of Blickling Hall. So are these the main features which are of particular interest to historians? Those certainly are in themselves, but uh, the circumstances by which the building became an assembly hall was of interest in itself. The Hobarts used it as a private assembly hall, but regularised it in 1753, when they leased the building for this specific purpose. So it is one of the oldest existing assembly halls in, <coughs> excuse me, in England. It was built then by Thomas Ivory and James Burrow and adopted its present form. But like the great Sir Nicholas Persson said of the assembly halls, Norwich can be as proud of its assembly house and no other town of its size in England has anything like it, except of course a spa town like Bath. So it became an assembly hall and thus it stayed until 1856, but it reopened in the 50s in its present form. Now, we've heard tonight, haven't we, that the roof is very badly damaged from the fire. Is that irreplaceable, as, you know, as far as they're concerned? It's probably irreplaceable. Once uh, an 18th century roof like that gets seriously burnt, it's very difficult to recover the timbers intact. And the Assembly House still requires a lot of archaeological investigation, as well, I hear. Because of the amount of material which may remain from the 13th century chapel. Lots of it has never been properly investigated, simply because that's such a destructive process. It's often in cases like a fire like this that these opportunities now arise, a very slight silver lining to a very black cloud. So, indeed, we don't know what else is at the Assembly House. It could be, you know, far more damaging than we originally think, then. It could have been, yes. Now, I understand as well that the main structure is 13... Uh, sorry, is 18th century. It is. Uh, 1753, various buildings on the site were all brought into one by the Norfolk architect Ivory, one of the great Ivory... Clan of, from the great Ivory clan of architects. The interior decorations are by the Cambridge amateur architect and master of Gonville and Keys College, uh, Sir James Burrow. And he made some very wonderful alterations to the interior. So wonderful that it, it 
is specifically described in Norfolk tour of 1808, where the huge open ballroom allows a long row of people to stand over a distance of 143 feet in a single open space, quite spectacular for its time. Those details, of course, have been altered and changed to fulfill the present function of the building. So overall, we, we, we look at it, it's very badly damaged. I'm sure it's an understatement for me to say that it's, it's very, very bad news. It's very bad news indeed. Well, Dr. Bill Wilson, a historic buildings consultant with the Norwich firm. Wilson Compton, thanks very much for joining us this evening. A new manager, but will that spell a change in fortunes for the Canaries? Find out tonight on Radio Norfolk's Soccer Special. We'll be at Carrow Road for Norwich City against Nottingham Forest, Gary Megson's first game in charge. A vital match for the Canaries as they continue their battle against relegation. It'll be a tough one as well. Norwich have lost their last three matches and Forest are unbeaten for six. If you're not at the game, the next best place is Radio Norfolk tonight from seven. Norwich City, Nottingham Forest. BBC Radio Norfolk, Sport. 22 minutes past six now, and this is Norfolk Tonight from BBC Radio Norfolk. I'm Stephen Lee. Good evening. Animal rights campaigners say they'll continue their protests against livestock exports despite a High Court ruling that local councils have no right to ban the trade. Two judges found in favour of companies wanting to export veal calves and other animals through Coventry Airport and the port at Dover. They said the local authorities had acted out of narrow self-interest. One of the judges said if the ports were not speedily open to the trade, the farming community of England and Wales faced a major economic crisis. Marcus Alton reports. Animal welfare demonstrators outside the High Court were clearly angry at the ruling. The judges said the exporters of live animals were conducting a lawful trade and the authorities must allow them to resume their business. After the decision, the animal rights campaigners gave their reaction. Appalled that people like that can be exporting animals in the conditions they export them to the fate that they know awaits them. They don't care. I'm upset but not surprised because I think yet again British justice has shown that profit is put before principle. Disgusting. Crying to heaven for justice. The judgment was linked to three cases. In one, Phoenix Aviation said Coventry City Council acted unlawfully by banning calf flights from the city's airport. In another, two companies challenged a ban imposed by the Dover Harbour Board. A further case involved the export of animals from Mill Bay Docks in Plymouth. The court strongly condemned the authorities involved for acting out of narrow self-interest. One of the exporters, Peter Gilder, told journalists he was delighted with the decision. Fantastic reaction, a, a brilliant result for the United Kingdom farming industry. Had you not won this judgment, what would have been the implications for your business? The implications for many businesses of the British farming industry would have been disastrous. Would you say will be further protest? Does that worry you at all? Uh, the the, the uh, judges have uh, told the necessary authorities the powers uh, available to them to control the demonstrations and so on. The court said that authorities must beware of conceding to the unlawful diktats of pressure groups. Animal welfare campaigners had argued in court that there could be legal limits on trade if it affected the health of animals. Peter Stevenson of the organisation Compassion in World Farming said the fight would go on. We're deeply disappointed at the outcome of these cases, but our campaign to end life exports will continue. Uh, this cruel trade in living creatures has no legitimate part to play in a modern civilised society. With the threat of further demonstrations, the Dover Harbour Board has expressed concern about the effects on its customers. The board's managing director, Jonathan Sloggett, said he was disappointed with the ruling. The board has been and remains very concerned that the admission to the port of Dover of the trade in live animals for export will cause considerable disruption to all the other users of the port. The board hopes very much that all those who sincerely object on moral grounds to the exportation of live animals for slaughter will accept that Dover has a legal duty to admit this trade uh, and cannot lawfully now refuse to do so. The police are also concerned there could be further large-scale demonstrations a spokesman for the Kent force, Mark Pugash, 
said contingency plans were being drawn up. Certainly there's the potential for considerable disruption. Uh, we have had close liaison with forces up and down the country. We have been personally to areas where there have been difficulties and um, we would hope that we would benefit from the, the experience that we have picked up. The High Court said campaigners should now consider carefully whether it was worthwhile pursuing their cause, but it seems that's a warning they intend to ignore. Marcus Alton reporting. Let's return to the Assembly House Norwich. We're joined again by Roger Ryan. I can tell you that the fire is still burning, but it is under control. Joining me now is Divisional Officer Malcolm Collier from the Fire Service. Malcolm, what's the latest? The situation there is that we've got the fire under control in the main building and we've stopped the spread of fire to any adjoining buildings and what we're doing now is to dealing with the fires in the roof timbers on the upper parts of the building at the same time we're carrying out salvage operations. How have you tackled this blaze this evening in Norwich? Well initially um, men were put inside the building with breathing apparatus sets on and jets but because of a immediate roof collapse they had to be withdrawn and we've tackled it by using a hydraulic platform um, from the top of the roof or over the roof and then using jets um, from ladders and uh, from the ground. How much of the building can be saved? It's difficult to say at the moment exactly. Um, there's extensive damage to the roof and to the upper floor areas in the main part of the building. At the moment, because of the um, dangers of structural collapse, it's uh, not possible to wander right through the building and see exactly what's damaged and what's still to be dealt with, but that will be doing shortly. What sort of problems does a blaze like this cause you? Well, tremendous problems. Um, a blaze like this occurring in the rush hour um, is a time of the day, in fact, when uh, water supplies in the centre of the city are fairly low. And uh, you appreciate that we need a fair amount of water on a fire like this. And so obviously we've had to, be, um, to go further afield to pick up our water and to bring it back into the site. The blaze broke, up, well, broke, uh, the blaze broke out shortly before five o'clock. What was your first reaction when you saw flames coming from the assembly house? Well, the, I received the message from the uh, headquarters in uh, Heliset, but uh, the first crews on arrival saw actually flames coming through the roof, and um, they immediately asked for assistance, and I must admit that when I left Heliset, I could already see the pall of black smoke over the city, so obviously I was aware then it was a fairly substantial fire. It's an important building in Norwich, very much part of the fabric of the city. How much of a loss is this to the city of Norwich? It's going to be a tremendous loss. Um, any fire is a loss to somebody, but when you get fires in these type of buildings, and obviously it's a loss to the uh, city itself, yes, very, very uh, unfortunate. It's very early days at the moment. Any idea of the cause of the blaze? No, we've had no idea at all yet. So we will have investigators looking at that shortly. How long do you expect to be here this evening? Difficult to say at the moment. It just depends on how quickly we can get through the building deal with all the hot spots and make sure we've got rid of all of the um, stuff that can be salvaged inside and got that away. So coming back to my earlier question, it is, uh, is under control? Yes. And you get, it's, it's, it's the later stages of the fire basically? That's right, yes. Hopefully we've now got the thing totally under control and uh, we should be able to start uh, reducing our levels of crews fairly shortly, but then it will be a fairly protracted incident to um, finish dealing with all the hot spots and to salvage all the remaining artefacts inside. What's it been like for the firefighters themselves? Pretty tough going, obviously. Um, when you're dealing with a fire like this and you've got to get inside and underneath one of these buildings and with the roof collapsing around you and upper parts of walls coming down, very, very difficult for them. Division Officer Collier, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Traffic and Travel from BBC Radio Norfolk. And heavy delays at the moment in Norwich following that fire at the Assembly House in Theatre Street. There are one or two closures adjoining Theatre Street, but all the roads that remain open in the area are very busy tonight. Well, further out, in our regular nightly look at potential delays to your journey out of the county, if you're planning to use the A12 tonight in Suffolk, there are a number of roadworks likely to slow you down. North of Woodbridge, along the Wankford Bypass, in Melsford, and through Kesingland. The A12 is affected in both directions in all of those locations by roadworks. Travelling to Sudbury, the, east of, the uh, eastern bypass rather, is still down to a single lane in both directions. In Essex, the A12 Chelmsford bypass is often slow. That's because of ongoing roadworks where various lanes are out of action from time to time. In Northamptonshire, the A45 is under repair between High and Ferrers and Stanwick. And in Lincolnshire, all traffic is down to just 50 miles an hour along the A1 south of Grantham for long-term roadworks until the summer. 
That's it for now. Warren Lee, AO Road Watch. Travel news from 95.1 and 104.4 FM. You're listening to Norfolk Tonight from BBC Radio Norfolk. It's half past six. Time now for the news headlines. The historic Assembly House in the centre of Norwich has been seriously damaged in a major fire. Around 16 fire engines were called to the building when the blaze started just before five o'clock. Although no one's been hurt, the roof has now collapsed. The whole area has been evacuated and Norfolk police are warning people to keep well away from the area. Norfolk police also say that tonight's performance at the Theatre Hall is expected to go ahead, although drivers should be aware that the city traffic is in chaos. Figures released today show that unemployment across Norfolk has dropped by over 500, bringing the jobless total for March to 29,104. Nationally, the number of people out of work and claiming benefits was down more than 20, 000, by more than 20,000 in March. Winnie Mandela has been given her jo government job back a fortnight after being sacked. Her estranged husband, President Mandela, has issued a statement saying her removal as an arts minister was legally invalid, so she is to be reinstated, only to be fired again, but this time correctly. A special police base is being set up on a housing estate in Kings Lynn, following concern from the public about crime. The idea was announced at the launch of the Western Divisional Police Plan. Other improvements include the setting up of a burglary squad, an increase in routine road checks to reduce car crime, and more special constables are also to be recruited. Those are the headlines. The weather forecast, after evening sunshine, there'll be some clear periods tonight with minimum temperatures of 3 degrees Celsius and also some ground frost. And the winds will be light northeasterly. It's now 6.32. Well, now it's time to take our weekly look at the issues which affect those with disabilities, their families and their friends. We'll start with an update of a story we told you about a few weeks ago. The West Norfolk Angling Club have been improving the facilities at Linsport for fishing. Volunteers have been working hard to make sure the lake was safer and more accessible, and they've also been landscaping, and so on has also been planned. Well, how are things progressing now? I'm joined on the phone from his home in Kings Lynn by Robert Bunting, who's part of the fishing group. Well, first of all, how are things going? Well, they're sort of progressing rapidly. We actually sort of completed the major part of the project, and all that's left really is sort of the coming weekend. We actually aim to take sort of the rest of the reeds and weed out of the lake, and sort of from then on, that will be all systems go, and we'll be able to start angling. Yeah. So it sounds things are going fairly much to plan then? Yes, yeah, we actually sort of started off, we had a bit of a problem with the weather, um, puts a few days behind, but we're all back on schedule now, and like I say, the plan is that by May the 8th, we should actually be fully operational. So what do you plan to end up with at the end of all this then? Well, what, what we've actually got is, is what we actually feel probably the best disabled fishing venue in the country. Um, accessible platforms that are safe. We've got a really gentle gradient rope and slope going down to, to the platforms. They've got railings around them. There's life-saving equipment. Um, so all, all they're specifically designed to you know, make the whole thing for disabled people much more, much more easier to go fishing? Yeah, that's correct, yes. And is this facility just for um, disabled people, or is it, can anyone just go along? No, the idea is that we're going to have sort of cater for everybody, juniors, disabled people, and sort of an open membership for anybody else, day ticket facilities, if you just like to come and try. Yeah, anybody. Now, I understand you had a meeting yesterday to talk about it. What happened there? Yes, the meeting was with Linsport. Um, they were actually helping us sell the tickets, and that was that was just basically to find out about the ticket charges that we're going to have to incur. Right, and now what, what kind of fish are you planning to stock the lake with then? Well, we've actually already stocked the lake with, with the help of the NRA, um, and Chris Newell, he's a fishery sort of manager. Um, we've got rudd, roach, perch, tench, carp of sort of different species. Yeah, that's, that's very well stocked actually, and sort of with... I don't know, sort of from very, very small fish to, uh, so I think the largest we have is around about seven pounds, so that could cater for everybody. Right, so how do you rate your abilities as a fisherman then? Well, Go on, here's your chance to be, um, <laughs> to blow your trumpet. Um, well, I actually fish for Eastern Region at national level, so... Oh, right, so you're the pro of the bunch then? Um, 
Well, I wouldn't say that, no. <laughs> I, I, I think, like everybody, we try, and that's the important part, yes. Yeah. I, mean, I know you've already said that, uh, earlier on, but do you want to just remind us when the opening is, then? That's on May the 8th, is the idea, and we're actually hoping on, on that day, we're actually hoping to get a sufficient celebrity down and sort of, to carry out the opening ceremony, and from then on there'll be sort of equipment available, and be, basically anybody can just come and try the venue, and hopefully that'll enable us to recruit new members and sort of do some public awareness of what this venture is all about. Well, I wish you luck, and uh, we'll do keep us informed of how you get on, won't you? Yes. That's fine. Okay, now, thanks very much for joining us, Robert. That's Robert Bunting, uh, joining us from his home in West Norfolk, and he's from the West Norfolk Angling Club. Well, let's move across to Deerham now, where traders in the town's access group have got together to start a shop mobility scheme. It's been in place for a year now, but I'm rather sorry to say there's been little take-up so far. Well, to find out why, I'm joined by Alan McKinn from the access group. Now, first of all, do you want to explain exactly what the scheme's about for those who may not realise? Well, as you say, it was just about a year ago that uh, a group of people came together in the Deerham area to uh, provide the means uh, for people with uh, walking disabilities to get around the shops in Deerham. Uh, we got together a few uh, uh, electric-powered scooters and uh, wheelchairs, and uh, the shop mobility scheme came into being. We launched a pilot scheme uh, in the April, uh, and uh, uh, well, how did that go? Was that a success? Well, um, there was plenty of in initial enthusiasm, but uh, there was a notable lack of people to actually come along and use the wheelchairs. Uh, it, this wasn't because of, of any lack of need for the, for the service that we were providing, neither was there a, a particular lack of people uh, in fact, there are about uh, getting on for 200 uh, people who are officially uh, uh, registered as having walking difficulties in and around the Deerham area. So why do you think there's been so little interest then? Well, why aren't people coming forward? Well, the reason would seem to be twofold. Uh, first and foremost, this, uh, they're dispersal over a wide area, uh, usually compounded by a complete lack of transport. Buses are a rarity. And uh, these people also tend not to have any access to cars. Uh, th there is another uh, element to this that um, also lack of confidence. Uh, people who um, lose the ability to walk tend to lose their confidence and really? everything runs away. So here we are then. We're in Durham and we're ready, uh, all ready to go to help these people to come into Durham uh, or rather to get around in Durham. You say, you, you say this all depends very much on the sort of the infrastructure that surrounds you almost. You say if people can't get access to cars, I mean, unless they get to Durham in the first place, then of course people aren't going to be taking up on this scheme, are they? Yes, well, we need to bridge the gap. Now, there are people who can help us do this. Uh, these are the people who, uh, who, who know someone uh, fitting into this picture. The people who know somebody uh, in the family or even down the road, uh, they just cannot uh, contemplate the, difficult, the sheer difficulty of actually getting, uh, getting into Durham and getting around. So these people uh, know uh, who, who need this, uh, this particular uh, service, and crucially, they have cars. Uh, what we need now are for these people uh, to identify the individuals who uh, are in their area and uh, who, whom they think can use our service uh, and bring them into Deerham. So, so you're looking at it from both ways, as well as people coming forward and saying, you know, I'd love to come to do my shopping in Deerham, but I just can't get in because I haven't got a car. We want them to come forward as well as other people who can look around and say, well, I don't know, maybe Mrs. Jones, two doors down, would like to come shopping, you know, how about we give her a lift? Yes, just that. The message to the... Uh, in this is, uh, if you like, is broaden the life, uh, take somebody in, do Durham shop, a bit, shop mobility. Mm. That's the message. What kind of people, I mean, you mentioned briefly what kind of people we know would want to use the scheme. Is, is it just people who'd be in a, in a wheelchair anyway, or maybe some elderly people who do find it difficult to wander around? Well, uh, this tends to be an invisible part of the population. Uh, uh, 
the, the people you see around shop, uh, shopping areas anyway are, uh, who are, have disabilities, um, they're in their wheelchairs or they're in their scooters. Uh, we're not really aiming for them because they are looking after themselves anyway. Right. What we're talking about is people who, by and large, are isolated within their own homes by their disability and by the sheer lack of confidence in getting out. So if someone's listening and they want to come on, I mean, they're thinking, well, how much do they have to pay for this? I mean, what's, what's the cost involved? Well, uh, that's an easy answer. There isn't one. Um, the scheme uh, that uh, we're starting uh, in operation this, this year, it's starting in, on Friday the 21st. And uh, for a start, uh, it will be on two days a week, on Tuesdays and Fridays. Um, and we have two electrically powered scooters ready, up and going. Um, they will be available for either the morning session or the afternoon session. The morning session, 10 to 12, and the afternoon from 1 until 3. 1 until 3. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, the, as I said, there's no charge, and the business of actually getting the scooters is simplicity itself. And it must, it's quite, it must be quite unusual for a town like Durham to have such a scheme in place. Uh, you, you, although, no, look, for example... Um, Castle Mall in Norwich has a mobility scheme going. Um, it strikes me, you know, was certainly you know very, very good for Durham to have one as well. It is indeed, and uh, it's uh, we've had a lot of support from the uh, uh, from the traders, uh, and we've had a lot of support from the uh, from the town council as well, uh, and not least from Breckland uh, District Council. Now, are there enough people sort of living around Durham who, who would be able to make the scheme a success? Well, as I said, uh, something around about two, 200 of them. Well, that's uh, that sounds we, quite we know, as well. We know they're there, but they are dispersed, and that is the trouble. So what, what would they tend to do now? Would they perhaps tend to come to Norwich, where maybe the, the facilities are a little more advanced, or would they just stay at home? No, they'll stay at home. Um, so we, we want to uh, get uh, the people who, who know individuals who are in this position to come in, or rather to get to the telephone to us and ring, it, ring us up. Now, the number is uh, Dearham 698866. Dearham 698866. Right. And what about volunteers? I understand there's, uh, do, uh, I know there's volunteers involved. I mean, do they accompany the, the shoppers round, or do they, are they simply there just to sort of dish out the, the scooters and things? Uh, the former. Uh, we, we, uh, we have no end of volunteers. Um, well, that's very impressive and as well, isn't it? It is very mm. impressive indeed. Um, and uh, we have a great depth of them. It's, uh, uh, we, we just uh, um, really want to get the people in. Right, fine. So we, we, just, it's up to people listening, is it, to make the effort and, and come up. Do you think other people, other towns in um, in Norfolk, could, you know, could take the initiative and follow your example as well? Well, uh, some can. Yes, some can. The uh, these are the ones with more residential populations. The ones with uh, uh, with uh, shifting tourist uh, throughput uh, will probably not need it so much. Right. But in Durham, we have. Um, we have a very wheelchair user-friendly uh, centre. We've just uh, had uh, uh, installed, or ra rather very recently installed, uh, a traffic uh, uh, management scheme, which has made the place extremely uh, safe for uh, people who are walking and in, and in wheelchairs. Yeah. So I was going to say, I imagine Deerham, I mean, obviously it's a very old market town. It's going to have sort of narrow doors, um, low ceilings, I suppose, in some places. Has that had an effect on um, where people can get to in a scooter? Well, we've, a lot of thought has been put into really trying to make it as accessible as possible. There are drop curbs uh, in all manner of strategic places now. And as I say, the centre of Deerham, the marketplace itself, is... Uh, uh, has been really very well laid out for people uh, with wheelchairs. Uh, we even have, would you believe, one bank and another two <laughs> banks who are coming on to being accessible. A very forward-thinking term. Yes, indeed. And uh, uh, we even have a Woolworths with a lift in it and uh, oh, all the facilities <laughs> on, the, on the top floor. Well, that's great. So let, let's just remind people, if, if they are listening and they want to get in contact with the Shop Mobility Scheme, if you can call... 01362 6988 That's 01362 
six nine double eight double six. And um, well, I hope people will listen and, and take up on uh, what's on offer. That's Alan McKee from the or Mackay rather from the DRM Access Group. Thanks so much for coming in tonight. Okay. Searching for up-to-date coverage of the county. <sighs> Then you want the latest Norfolk and national news in the morning. A sports service that's second to none and local issues that can't. Why not place your order now and have all that delivered personally to your home by myself, Jim Cassidy. That's each weekday morning between 6 and 9. Find out first what's happening in your county with Today in Norfolk from the BBC. Available on a radio near you. The Norfolk file is open every weekday between half past one and three. And this is Key Skipper with a few tasty promises to put adventure into your April and real meaning into your May. Let's go in search of Norfolk's lost villages and the county's oldest pub. Let's share some stories about Norfolk eccentrics and meet local writers who drop in for a marvel. Now what about football teams who lost by over 40 goals or cricket sides skittled out for nothing? It's time to own up and step forward with a smile. Old friends, new ideas, fresh voices, with the well-being of dear old Norfolk at the heart of all our deliberations. That's the Norfolk File, open every weekday between 1.30 and 3, with so many chances for you to get really involved. You're listening to BBC Radio Norfolk. It's now just after a quarter to seven. We'll return to the Assembly House in Norwich, where we've had a very serious fire this evening. We're joined by Roger Ryan. I can tell you at the moment that the, the fire is... Uh, is drawing to a close here at the Assembly House in Norwich. Uh, Picture-wise, the roof is gone, the building is still standing, but it's a heck of a mess at the moment down here. Most of the firemen seem to be wrapping up at the moment. The crowds are dispersing, but there's still some smoke coming from the top of the building. Let me go back to the start of the story. Nobody has been hurt as far as we know in the blaze. Uh, tonight's performance of the ballet at the Theatre Royal may go ahead. There's a meeting at the moment to decide if it will go ahead. And as soon as we know, we'll let you know. Roger Ryan reporting for BBC Radio Norfolk in Norwich. Sports News Now, here's um, Matthew Gutchin. Good evening. Just an hour before the biggest test of Gary Mixon's footballing career so far... The Norwich City caretaker boss shoved in at the deep end earlier this week following the resignation of John Dean will lead the Canaries into battle against Nottingham Forest at Carrow Road. Forest's recent record away from home is formidable with seven straight wins. Norwich, by contrast, have lost their last three. There'll be no Robert Ullathorne in the City lineup tonight. The midfielder's out with a knee injury and is likely to be replaced by Neil Adams. Another key member of the Norwich midfield tonight will be Ian Crook. He says if anyone can keep them in the Premiership, Gary Mixon can. You only had to watch Gary as a player to know that he was 110% uh, committed. And I'm sure he'll be exactly the same uh, again as a manager. And he, uh, He's got the full backing of each and every one of the players and um, we know he's I think a bit very good motivator and hopefully as I say we can uh, pull it around and get a few results now Manchester United came from behind twice on Sunday against Crystal Palace to force a replay in their FA Cup semi-final tie the rematch takes place this evening at Villa Park and the United skipper Steve Bruce will be in the side after suspension United are still aiming to repeat the FA Cup and Premiership double, and Bruce, who was on the bench on Sunday, was seen to smile after the game when it finished 2 all. I think it was a smile that, you know, we were another crack at it, to be fair. I mean, it wasn't a smile that, oh, good, I'm going to be back for the replay. I would have rather have gone on to Wembley, you know, if the lads had got through, it would have been uh, tremendous. But um, it's always nice to play in a semi-final. They're full of, it's a great game to play in and a great game to be involved in. It is totally a uh, disappointment when you miss out through suspension. We're still in with a chance, you know, we're on the shout, we're in the semi-final and, uh, and with eight points behind the leaders, we know it's going to be tough to catch them, but we're still there with a little sneaky chance and uh, I'm sure everybody in the dressing room here won't, uh, won't give up that fight. Spurs boss Jerry Francis says he's been told by Jurgen Klinsmann that the German striker will be staying with the club for next season. There had been speculation Klinsmann would leave Spurs for Bayern Munich at the end of this season. 
Britain will field a new look Davis Cup tennis team when they meet Slovakia in their Euro Africa Group 2 tie in Bratislava later this month. Non-playing captain Billy Wright has named the relatively inexperienced quartet of Chris Wilkinson, Danny Sapsford, Tim Henman and Neil Broad. Norfolk tennis youngster David Crawley is out of the British National Junior Championships in Telford. David from Great Yarmouth lost his quarter-final in straight sets today to Yorkshire's David Sherwood, 6-3, 6-4. That's just about it from the sports desk. Don't forget, 7 o'clock, our soccer special. Right now, though, the lines are opening for the score guest competition. Give us a ring on 617-321 if you want to predict tonight's final score, Norwich City versus Nottingham Forest. That number one more time, 617-321 in Norwich. I'm back just after 7. That's Matthew Gudgeon with the sports news. Ten to seven now, and well, I have to say, I do enjoy cooking, and so I avoid convenience food like the plague, but my final guest this evening could put some of the best social entertainers to shame. Paul and Stephanie Allen certainly know how to throw a dinner party, and you can guarantee the perfect wine to accompany the meal. Both are champagne and wine importers, and they join me now in the studio. Well, I have to say, you used to work for BT, an unusual change of career. What made you do that? What made you change careers to become wine importers? <laughs> Well, we've always had a hobby. Wine has always been a hobby. I actually trained as a home economist, so food and wine have always been part of our, our life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it seemed the right thing to do at the time. BT was offering a lot of money for managers to leave. Well, we you can hear someone pouring us some, um, <laughs> some wine out already. Thank you, thank you. I have to say, when you, when you called up the other day and you said, oh, shall we bring some wine in? And I said, well, I wasn't going to ask, but if you're going to offer, then I shan't say no. A wine merchant never goes anywhere and he handed. <laughs> and, I, and I saw you even said a... Um, I you even had a um, corkscrew in of your course. in your handbag as well. So of there we go. Well Always prepared. prepared. <laughs> and <laughs> you were drinking in our plastic cups as well. I suppose that's sacrilege, really, isn't it? <laughs> there we go. Uh, you, you, did, I, you did a training course as well, didn't you, to, to, you know, to switch over and learn how to do wines? Yes, we'd uh, both been interested in wine for uh, about 15, 16 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and in order to get credibility in the wine trade, we thought it was sensible to think about doing something um, that would give us that credibility. The Wine and Spirit Education Trust run exams, um, a basic course in wine, then a higher certificate and a diploma and so on to a Master of Wine. And we thought that we ought to sit that. We missed the basic course out and went straight into the higher certificate, which we were both successful in. Surprisingly. Yes, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what it is about wine that you find so interesting then. What is it about it? Ooh. Well, uh, the nice part as far as uh, Henry Peak Wines is concerned is that since we bought the business, which is 18 months ago, uh, I'm able, Stephanie unfortunately doesn't get the travelling that I do but uh, as the managing side of the business I'm mm -hmm. able to go out into France uh, and look at various growers and talk to them meet them, see what's happening and so on and that's much l nicer to be able to sell your wine mm. when you come back to England uh, you've got something about the growers where you've been, met them and so It's on. very important to have a sort of very close link to it's the people very you're buying from. Uh, I'm waiting for an invite to Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> but then we'll both go <laughs> <down. laughs> To buy some very nice Jacob's Creek, I suppose that's advertising really. I, <laughs> that's that, but I have to say that's one of my favourite ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stephanie, you look after the, P, the, the PR and so on. How yeah. difficult is it to compete in a market like this? It's, it's quite interesting because I've always been in marketing and I've always had the, the theory and suddenly you're, you're down there at the sharp end and of course we have what in, in marketing terms is a unique selling point. Anybody can come into our shop, they haven't got to worry about their knowledge of wine because we are, I hope, friendly, we will always give advice but more to the point, we will, as we've done for you tonight, open a bottle. Mm. Now, you can't get that in a supermarket, and one's got to say that supermarkets do us a great favour. They put people onto perhaps something like the wine you've just mentioned, mm. and then they can come to us, the customer can come to us and say, look, I like this wine, but there must be something extra. And we can give that advice, we're trained, we've got the skills, but also we've got the corkscrew in the handbag, we <laughs> can open it up. <laughs> I mean, uh, from reading your brochure, there's a point that definitely comes across mm. that you, you just don't compete with supermarkets, no. you're a different league. No, we are, I suppose, in marketing terms, a niche market. Yeah. Having said that, our, our lowest price bottle is 349 and it goes up to, say, £399. Well, no, that's interesting. Oh, well, we are. <laughs> that's a lot of money you for a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, well, I mean, that, that strikes me, it, well, it's quite good in a way, because I'd yeah. imagine if you go to a wine um, in port like this, you're going to be paying, you know, £10, £20 pounds a bottle of wine. We if, you go, if you go down quite to cheap wines yeah. as well. We've certainly 
found out that, uh, that, that what we try to do is to say there's a certain standard that we'll set ourselves. If there's anything that falls below the standard at the right price, then we won't have it. So long as the quality is there at the right price, then we'll go for it. Um, and wow. we can certainly compete on those terms. Now, I'm saying I buy most of my wine for the supermarket, and I go by the price rather than the label. Yeah. Am I the kind of customer that you'd want to attract, or do you yeah, go yeah. for a, sort of a connoisseur type? I, I actually had a, a guy come into the shop uh, a few weeks ago who said, I always buy my wine in supermarkets. And I said, how much do you pay for it? And he said, I haven't the faintest idea. And I said, well, next time you go, would you just look and see what you spend on it? Because it's like everything else. They go for the month shopping or the week shopping and put two or three bottles in. And he came back and he said, I could save money if I came to you because I actually get case discount, which I don't get at supermarkets. Right. Um, and so it's interesting. But he said, I hadn't realised it and I hadn't thought about it. But now you've mentioned it, I can taste my wine before I buy it. Uh, and I'm very happy to do mm. that. Well, again, as I say, I've got your brochure here, and the, the whole tone of the brochure is very sort of friendly and informal, and that's the whole basis of your approach, obviously. That's yes. right. Yes. I mean, I, I was very conscious when I wrote the brochure to say, look, we're ordinary people. There's no pretensions, no snobbery, and more to the point, it's quite rare when... No, it, it's obviously rare for women to be heavily involved in the wine trade. And we have quite a few fellas come in and say, oh, because my wife knows nothing about wine. Well, I'm sorry, but, you know, come on, ladies, come and see us. Mm. This is the whole point. Well, you know, we, we heard the bottle glug glugging earlier. <laughs> so we, I've got my wine in front of me. So what, what am I about to drink? Come You're about to drink one of the uh, ten growths of Beaujolais. Right. A lot of people get Beaujolais as the drink that says, oh, it's Beaujolais Nouveau and gets a lot of bad press. This is actually from the village of Chena, uh, and it's a delicious Beaujolais. Uh, right. But so there are ten I'll, try, I'll try some of you your talking. You try it, Stephen, see what you think. <laughs> Well, that's very nice, but then again, I like all kinds of wine, so... <laughs> am I, do, now, do I, do I sniff it, or do I spit it into... I've swallowed it. I'm I will. I'm much more swallow. fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, the trouble is that Beaujolais has a lot of bad press. Um, Nouveau gives it a lot of uh, bad news. There's some awful stuff around. But when you get to the ten growths of Beaujolais, and there's some tremendous wines around, varying from about five pounds up to about eight right. or nine pounds. So what, what's the difference between paying, say, three pounds a bottle of um, cheap white to paying 15 for a bottle? So what do you get for the extra money? Well, you've got to say that the first one pound 20 of any bottle is government excise duty. And I, right. we won't harp on about that, but in France, it's only about tuppence. In England, it's one pound 20. So whatever you're paying, one pound 20 of that has got to be excise duty. Right. Um, there's another pound or so shipping. So then you start looking at the quality of the wine. Right. Well, I have to say, we have to cut our interview slightly short tonight because of the fire at the Assembly House. We'll return to that in a few minutes' time. But for people that are listening now that want to get in contact with you, now, what's your number? Fire away. 616368 is our telephone number and 41 to 43 Elm Hill. You're welcome any time. Right. Well, Paul and Stephanie Allen, thanks very much for coming in tonight. And I was to say thanks very much for bringing in the, the bubbly as well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as I say, we'll return now to the scene of the fire in Norwich City Centre. Uh, the Director of Arts and Libraries for Norfolk, Hilary Hammond, joins our reporter, Roger Ryan. We'll go to the scene now. Yes, Mr Hammond is with me now. Mr Hammond, how important is the Assembly House to the people of Norwich? It's a major building and a major service that the trustees have provided for many, many years. I've used the Assembly House myself very often, and it's, it's crowded. Many, many people use it. And, of course, it contains a large number of very interesting and exciting objects. The trustees have held a meeting already this evening. What's happening there? The trustees are working with their uh, insurers and the loss adjusters and working out what material they can salvage and where they can take it to. I'm here as a neighbour, of course. The, the uh, Assembly House is the responsibility of the trustees, not of the County Council. But we had that fire last August and we've learned some lessons that we are sad to have to be able to... That was to the pass. fire at the library? That was the fire at the library in last August in the Central Library. We're very sad that we've are able to pass on those lessons, very sad that we've got to pass on those lessons, but at least we can help. A tough question, this one, in financial terms. How much is our building worth? I have absolutely no idea at all. Um, we haven't yet settled the finances on the insurance claim on the library, and that was a fire that was eight months ago. It'll take a long, long time before people have been able to work that one out. But is it a building you would have to replace in Norwich, re rebuild it as it, as it was? Well, that must be a question for the trustees and their insurers, and I'm afraid I can't comment on that at this stage. Mr. Harmon, thanks for joining me this evening. Let me just tell you before I do go, Stephen, that there is still some smoke coming from the roof of the building, but the fire is under control, and uh, fire service crews and police are still here at the scene. 
Thanks very much indeed. That's Roger Ryan reporting there live from the Assembly House in Norwich, which has been very badly damaged by fire tonight. A message on my screen saying the Theatre Royal performance tonight will go ahead as normal at 8 o'clock, but I assume that um, the road is still closed, and of course there'll be very bad traffic chaos there, so do watch out if you're in the area. Well, that brings this evening's programme to a close. Tonight's programme was produced by Janet Harden. I'm Stephen Lee, and I hope you'll join me again at five o'clock tomorrow for an edition of Norfolk Tonight. I'm off to drink the rest of the bottle of this wine now. Talk of the County on 95.1 and 104.4 FM. You're listening to BBC Radio Norfolk. It's now 7 o'clock. The news with Debbie Tubby. The main story this evening.